record. All right. Uh, welcome everybody to this jumpstart session, which is kind of, um, Jason and I had been talking about what role academic technology could play in um, Jumpstart and then in January Jamboree. And he had mentioned that he and Melissa had looked at some um, surveys from students about uh, engagement, especially during, during COVID and some of the moves to remote teaching. Um, and Jason was working with IT to figure out some programming and it all just kind of gelled together um, when I told him that today's Jumpstart programming was focused really on kind of basics to get us started in thinking about design. Um, so he and Melissa are going to talk about the basics of instructional design, particularly for um, online learning, for learning that makes use of the learning management system, in our case, uh, Moodle and transitioning to Canvas. Um, and the other thing is that for those of you who don't know these folks, I'm sure they will introduce themselves a bit as we go. Um, but Jason also offers uh, lots of Moodle support workshops as well. So in terms of just sort of getting into the back end of, um, of how to design using the learning management system. Um, Jason will be back again later in the week talking about the transition over to Canvas. So if um, anybody is a Moodle user and getting ready to either pilot Canvas now or thinking ahead to using Canvas next year, that will be a session as well. Um, I'm not gonna be facilitating this uh, session so much, so I'll keep a, a little bit of an eye on the chat, but other than that, I'm gonna turn it over to Jason and Melissa. And we do have a small number of folks from other USNH institutions. So maybe just uh, tell us a little bit about who you are before you launch in. Sounds good. Uh, Melissa, you wanna go ahead and start? Sure, I was muted. Um, I am so glad you're all here for this session. Um, like Robin said, this came about um, because of what our students were saying. So I had heard from um, several students directly and from faculty members and in our student surveys um, that this kind of um, presentation was necessary. And it's because the students are confused and um, they don't really know where to go to find their course content necessarily. So um, I'll let Jason introduce himself and then we can get into, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what the surveys told us um, just briefly and then we'll get into the design elements. So most of you guys should know me by now, but I'm Jason Enos, an educational technologist here uh, stationed at PSU. Um, I've been here for about a year now um, and I'm your Moodle guy as many of you guys know, but uh, I have a background in, in, in instructional design um, and educational technology. Uh, and I'm a former classroom teacher myself um, where I taught um, high school history and government in a numerous locations around the country. So um, yeah, this, this conversation is always near and dear to my heart because I love what's going on in the classroom and making sure you guys get the help that you, uh, that you guys need as you do it. So Melissa is uh, the co-pilot and she's the one who uh, brainstormed this and said, we should talk about this. Um, and she's the director of institutional effectiveness here and has the data to say, to hear, you know, has the voice of our students in mind as we talk about this topic. So let's uh, kick it off with the, uh, Melissa, anything else to offer for your introduction? Um, just Robin had said there's some other folks here from other USNH institutions. I'm just curious if you could introduce yourself and tell me which institution you're from. Hi, I'm, you, uh, at least I'm here. My name is Tanim Hussain. I'm at Keene State. Okay, thank you. My daughter goes to Keene State. Hi, I'm Holly Falzo. I'm also from Keene State. Hi, Holly. Okay. Hi, I'm Jenny Darrow, also from Keene State. Looks like we have a, oh, wow. a crew of us there. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, Keene crew here. Um, so when I start, when I, I get I think into... there's more too. Oh, um, wow, so okay, cute. Yeah. sorry. Sorry, um, go ahead, I... others. I'm Barbara McCann. I'm from Plymouth State. Barbara just wants us all to know that she's here. But Barb, hey, Barbara, I will tell you, you, she came in just a minute late, but um, uh, Melissa's looking for folks who are not from Plymouth um, to introduce themselves. Oh, so I think um, Siobhan, are you here? Yeah. I see? I'm Siobhan, senior from uh, UNH Durham. Okay. Hi, Siobhan. And who else? 
That might be it. That's it, yep. Okay. Go okay, thank you. So um, I'm gonna lead in with some of the results of the data. Now for um, the UNH um, member and the Keen members, this is not your campus, but this was done at your campuses as well. And a lot of the comments and things the students were saying are very similar to what Plymouth's were. Um, so we, we had a couple surveys over the fall and they were done system-wide in all of the residential institutions. They were, kind, they were short, they were kind of like pulse checks um, of how the students were doing. There was one done in September and one done in October. And there was one key question that the Board of Trustees and the um, AEC, Academic Excellence Council, I think, um, were interested in, and that was overall, I am satisfied with how I am able to learn in my courses this semester. This data that you're looking at is undergraduates. Um, so these the students that took the surveys, they were divided into three categories, face-to-face, um, -face, mix, and online. And they were chose to choose the category that most represents the courses they're taking. So maybe if they were taking four online courses and one mix, they would choose online because they're primarily taking online. Mix would be hybrid or a mix of face-to-face -face and online. So of the face-to-face, students in September, 70% were satisfied with how they were learning. In October, it went down to about 58%. When we get to the mix, um, we decrease a little bit more. Um, in September, a little over 50%. And then in October, it was about 45. But the online only um, was under 40%. It, it really was about 39% both September and October. So that's telling us that over 60% of the students um, aren't satisfied in how they were learning online. For Plymouth, our response rates were 19% for September. So that was 736 respondents. In October, um, a little lower because that's a, the, the surveys are pretty close together, right? 15% um, with 577 respondents. Uh, next slide, please. So that only gives us a small picture of what's going on. Um, the qualitative feedback is really um, where we can kind of dissect why the students are saying these things. There were a lot of positive comments. Some of those um, you can read up on the screen, but I just wanted to explain the way we got that qualitative data. So there was one question in particular where students were just able to talk about their experience. It was very open-ended response. And then there were two, there were two questions, um, one, one regarding um, accessibility to services and the other regarding technology where they were given an option to expand on their quantitative response with, with some qualitative data. Uh, next slide, please. At Plymouth, we didn't have like several responses, but we did have 208 respondents in September and 188 in October. Um, you'll notice, I just have to move our faces, sorry. Um, you'll notice that there were 334 responses in September and 271 in October. And that's because some are duplicative. So if a student went in and they said, um, I'm struggling with mental health issues and the Wi-Fi is always down in PEMI. That's two different categories of concerns. One is mental health and one would be the Wi-Fi software Zoom issues. So um, in that sense, that's why we see more responses than respondents. Um, so when we're looking at the Wi-Fi and Zoom issues, um, those are out of our control. Um, I know IT has been working hard to resolve some of those. And at Plymouth, it was primarily Wi-Fi issues. There were some concerns with Zoom, primarily the first day of classes when Zoom crashed for all of us. So um, PSU, PSU that, cannot control that one. Okay, guys, we can, we can only do so control. much. Right, so, so in that sense, um, we can't do anything about that. Um, and that's stuck in the students' heads. Um, but then we have the Wi-Fi issues. And if you're on Plymouth campus, you know we've had Wi-Fi issues um, throughout the term, really concentrated in the first, um, probably the first month or so um, on campus. So in that, in September, those students were really feeling um, those Wi-Fi issues. So 70% of them said um, 
they had Wi-Fi software or Zoom issues. Again, remember this is the quali qualitative responses only. This is not the quantitative. Um, difficulty of online learning without enough help or advising. Um, if you can bear with me for one second, I just have to pull up. I have a few student quotes um, that I'd like to share with you in regards to these, um, but I am having a little bit of an issue here. Jason, you want to talk for a sec? Sure. So, you know, like we talked about, some of these things are definitely out of control. The Wi-Fi software Zoom issues, we can we can only do so much to work with. Um, but as we as Melissa pulls up the code, it's the difficulty in online learning without help or advising. And one of the things we really want to talk about, because that can also be coupled with the faculty to not teaching well and students teaching themselves with a the hybrid Zoom and online. And the really thing that we're concerned about is is that digital interface that our students are using can be problematic sometimes. Um, you know, I always work with instructors. I always want them to understand that like, yes, you know, your classroom is your domain and you know, whatever you do is in your classroom is an extension of yourself. And anybody who's seen me teach knows my classroom is a chaotic craziness that I thoroughly enjoy. Um, but I still strive to have some structure in it to make it easier for my students. Um, and so that extension of that of yourself to your classroom also is going to extend to your digital frameworks and what you do digitally in for your learning for your students. And that's the biggest thing I find myself concerned about as I as I work with the instructors here is making sure that we're doing what's best for our students as they craft their digital learning um, for the uh, digital experiences for their students. Thank you, Jason. Um, I'm all set now. Sorry about that. No problem. Um, so when we get into the difficulty of online learning without enough help or advising, um, this is what one of our students said, and it sums up what a lot of others said in their uh, qualitative responses as well. Online learning is different and needs to be planned as online learning. There was plenty of time for this conversion, but nothing was done, not even a Moodle shell outlining expectations. Even as a face-to-face -face class, this would have been disappointing. So some of these comments are a little bit um, difficult to hear or read because everyone's been working so hard this term. But I think a lot of what the students are saying here are things that, that we can improve. Um, so when we talk about the next one, too much work or material for an accelerated term, um, I think it's pretty self-explanatory, um, but the student, one of the students said this semester, all the information has been way too rushed. It feels like even though the semester is shortened, the effort to make the course load fit the new schedule has not been there. And that was echoed throughout several student comments. Um, so this one, faculty not teaching well and students teaching themselves. And that, that was really focused on the hybrid Zoom and online, um, not on the face-to-face. -face. And I think we could even see that in that first slide where it talked about the satisfaction levels of the students. So what does that mean? Um, there were, there were several comments that referred to faculty needing training in online teaching and the technologies required for online or hybrid teaching. Um, so there were a lot of, my faculty um, doesn't really understand Moodle. Um, there should be some training in Zoom because you know I'm in the waiting room for a really long time. And I know that was a change in Zoom during the term, um, but things along those lines. Um, the outcome of this is unfortunate. Um, several students felt that because of these um, issues, um, that school was, quote, a waste of money, um, they weren't getting what they're paying for, or they're taking next semester off because of this. So it is something that we, we need to really listen to the students' voice in this area. Um, problems accessing tutoring, advising, and other assistance. Um, a student says, I need help academically. I need help keeping on track with my work and I need better help understanding it. Please, I am really struggling and I'm falling behind. Other students said they're not sure where to look. Um, others said advisor calendars are full. So several of our students have had um, difficulties accessing um, the help and the services they need. Response time from faculty and staff and other communications, communication concerns. There were several comments related to faculty not responding to multiple student emails and also concerns about responsiveness for um, tutoring, advising, and counseling. I did dig into this a little further because it's interesting to me, like response time is so subjective. Like what is a student's expectation of what a, 
a reasonable response time would be. We don't have that information, but we should get it. Um, but we, we were able to look back and see, well, what was our response time um, in the spring? And what's our response time now based on the windows of time that the students chose um, on response time. And we did find that from spring to fall, um, response time for online courses um, has increased about 50%. However, the average is still under 24 hours. So I think that's pretty good to be under 24 hour response time, but we just have to be careful about those um, longer response times. Remember, we're dealing with the TiVo generation here. They're used to skipping commercials. They want things now. Yes, <laughs> they do. Um, stress and mental health concerns. Um, I think that everyone in the world is probably feeling some of this right now. Um, but several students did share concerns of stress and mental health. Um, several also mentioned the lack of mental health days. It was really difficult for them to deal with that um, losing vacation days um, because they felt like they were just going nonstop. So a quote from a student, my mental health is at an all time low from the stress involved with the changes and lack of assistance. And it doesn't seem like anyone on campus cares. Despite our COVID-19 numbers being low, I'm highly disappointed this fall semester. And lastly, Moodle issues. Um, and this quote is, is directly applicable to some of what we're talking about today. Um, a student says, it can be difficult if teachers' Moodle pages are messy. Links get lost easily and they expect us to be able to find things. Having a designated homework session or cleaner Moodle pages since being online more often would have a significant positive impact on my learning experience. Um, could you go to the next slide, please? Okay, so this next slide is a long quote from a student, but it pretty much encompasses a lot of different elements um, that the students were talking about. Um, so, Unfortunately, the student feels the semester was disappointing and, and they, they recognize that teachers have different ways of teaching, um, but, but the lack of consistency is confusing for them. Um, again, they, went, they mentioned their money and the quality of education. Um, they might be studying elsewhere if this continues. So again, like this is a hard time for all of us. So we understand that. And, and there were a lot of students who said um, the faculty members are, are really trying hard to help me and things along those lines. There were more students who had concerns. Um, so we do have to listen to the student voice and, see, and hear what they're saying. Um, next slide, please. Oh, you can skip that one. That was a duplicate. And so what they're talking about in, in that quote that we saw does play out. Um, there's a research study that unfortunately I don't have the link to. I will gather it. I will get in the chat later on and I apologize. Um, but it's titled, Are Quality Indicators of Online Courses Able to Predict Student Success? And what this uh, study did is looked at kind of what you generally see in your online course design. Um, you know, with the name brand being Quality Matters for course design and seeing, hey, does this affect uh, student success or does it predict student success? And the, one of the closing quotes says, design and organization construct was a key factor in influencing student outcomes. Design and organization positively and significantly influence students' perceptions of learning and satisfaction. Specifically, efforts should be made to determine the types of learning objectives, align activities with learning objectives, and organize the overall course by instructors and instructional designers. And so that last part is what we're seeing in our student surveys, uh, specifically talking about course, you know, digital organization. And then what this research is saying that we need to be looking at the overall course, uh, overall design of the courses. Now, the caveat is this is talking about online instruction, but online instruction and really what I call the digital environment is what's, you know, is one of those scenarios which is good for the goose is good for the gander. You know, as you, you know, as one of our students talked about in their feedback, you know, not having an organized course was, you know, bad and really bad in online, but still would have been disappointing in face to face. And these are students who at this point have come through K-12s that are that have learning management systems and are used to being able to have one go to place for organiz uh, for their course organization. And so that's what we're going to kind of talk about is getting a framework to make it easier on yourself and your students. And so the next slide is an exercise. So taking a look at this slide, I want you guys to uh, take a look at this course uh, page. 
go and throw in the chat, what do you think is the topic of this course? What do you think this course is being, what do you think is being taught in this course? If any of you guys are brave enough to actually want to comment out loud, go ahead and mute your mics. Otherwise you can throw in in the chat, what do you think is the class, the, what class is being taught in this course? Kathy LeBlanc, anthropology, 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 something about sound, history, Eastern culture, world music, culture. Oh no, there we go. Sorry, I went to scroll through my chat. All right, I wanna call on some people. Kathy, I'm gonna call on you because I know you. Kathy, why do you say anthropology here? Um. The, the text is too small for me to read, so I couldn't see any of the text, but gotcha. this this image, I don't know, just reminds me of studying culture, so that's why I thought anthropology. Cool, thank you. Um, Megan Hederick, Heinrich, I apologize for butchering that. It's okay. <laughs> you, threw, you said something about sound. Why'd you, why'd you say that? Um, well, uh, the person, the, um, I know that the picture, um, is, is it Kabuki theater? It's like a, that's what it reminded me of, of okay. some sort of a, a Asian theater. And, um, and then they, they said amplifiers and decibels, which to me said sound. <laughs> yep. Okay. Um, Sibahan. You said OMG is is it electronics? Can you elaborate? Just because I googled common source amplifier, I had no idea what it was. So, and this is where you know it's hard to do it over Zoom, um, but and Kathy couldn't read the uh, text, but yeah, it talks about common source amplifier. So that was your clue that it was something with electronics, right? I guess. So this course is electrical engineering for all those who are you know, wondering what it is. And this is my, one of my prime example, go-to examples of what we need to think about in course design. Um, the picture that you guys, that we all gravitated to is um, a pictures from the instructor's travels throughout the world. And while I love that he brought that personal identification in, this, this, these travel pictures were strewn all about this course. And so it really kind of threw, you know, whenever I show this exactly what happens, it kind of throw people's, it throws people off because they're used, they, they go to the picture and they get the anchoring of, okay, we're talking about Eastern culture, we're talking about anthropology, we're talking about music, and then they go to the actual text and like, oh, it's electronics or something else. And so, yeah, you know, this is what we talk about and when we talk about what, how, why course design is important. And I know Melinda, um, Melissa has an anecdote from one of her students this semester talking about why courses, you know, what course design, what's important about course design. Uh, yeah, so I have, I have several anecdotes. Um, but my students were talking about um, online learning and hybrid learning and how they are struggling so much this term. And I asked them, why are, there, why are they struggling? They said, it's confusing. Um, and I asked them, did you take online courses in high school? Like your last semester in high school, was that online? Yes, it was. And I asked them, well, what's different about this? Is it the work or, and they said in high school that last semester, a lot of it felt like busy work, um, which it might've been with that quick pivot to online learning. That was really difficult for teachers. Um, but they said, the thing that's easier is they had Google Classroom. So they always started somewhere and they knew, you know, the teachers might have them doing different things and different tools or blogging or, or what have you, but they had that, um, can I call it base camp, Kathy? They had that base camp to go to um, where it was kind of like the gateway to their learning and they knew where to go. Um, so, so some of what they're struggling with this term is you know, several faculty members are using diff different applications and that's great, no problem, but they don't have that starting point. So they get confused because maybe a faculty member is using Teams um, as their primary place where they're posting assignments and students are actually turning in assignments there. 
um, and another faculty member is using Moodle. And, and there's several other applications that are used on campus. And, and that's fantastic. They just get confused because they don't know where am I supposed to go first? Um, so like, I think about it like, do we want our students um, to spend their time and their cognitive resources on learning our course content? Or do we want to want them to spend their time and cognitive resources on finding the course content? So I would go with on learning the course content personally. Um, so that's why we're talking a little bit about how to um, use your LMS um, to design course materials. And so as we transition to Canvas here at PSU and some of our other, other institutions also, Canvas actually did some research study about um, engagement in their courses with, with good course design. Um, well-designed digital course materials increases student engagement is what they what they uh, gathered um, and so they kind of identified a couple different ways of how courses are designed and the first one they talk about is the complex shallow designs and so you can see hopefully in this picture of where they have a lot of things available in their course menu and then in you can see in their syllabus but nothing's linked Nothing, there's no links that they can quickly go to to find what they're referring to, as you can see from this um, cognitive psych um, image on the left. And then once they get to materials, if you look on the image on the right, they have just a Word document that is, um, that can be downloaded to utilize. And what Canvas saw in their engagement metrics, metrics is, you know, your average rate of student submission was at 84%. And your average rate of student interactions per discussion was about 1.6. And so you're not getting as much comparatively when they look at what they called a simple deep design. The course menu over here on the left on my left image is significantly less. They have one place to go to. So talking about what uh, Melissa is talking about with her students, the students had one launching point to go to. They went to the learning management system. And then you can hang any kind of thing off that that you wanted them to go to. But even within the learning management system, they only had one area to go to. They went to their key modules area or one key area, and they had all the things that they had to utilize right from there. And then on top of that, when you go down to a deeper organization within the within the course, you had one images that make sense talking about writings and you have actual images of your authors and not your random travels throughout the world. Um, but then they had links within there. So it's easy to find and easy to, uh, easy to get to when they need to do their materials. And you can see the average rate of ass assignment submissions went up by 4%. And the average, average and range of interactions went from, let's see, previously it was 1.67 and 3.68 to 2.1 and 11.74. So pretty, some pretty significant increases just by the simple fact of an organ, a well-organized course. Can I jump in for one second and just uh, remind folks who, um, I know none of you are new to Zoom, but I just wanna remind you that if it helps to look at the slides in more detail, you can play around with your configuration because there's ways to pretty much completely get rid of your gallery so you're not looking at any faces um, including the speaker and you're making that screen bigger um, yes. it, sometimes it can help when we're really talking about the details so just um, play around click buttons the worst that can happen is you get kicked out you'll come back um, but if you're having trouble seeing it really helps to have it full screen and we'll definitely you can we'll give Ms. Robin the slide deck so she can share it with and you guys can peruse it later I'd like to just add on to something Jason just said um, about the links being in the design um, that was another element that um, the students talked to me about that minimum, if those links to those technology resources were in Moodle, um, that would help them immensely. And so I know some of you guys here at PSU are being like, Jason, we're not on Canvas yet. I know you love Canvas. It's the greatest thing that you love and you want. We're on Moodle right now. You know what? I got some great examples here from our one and, and Kathleen Blanc, who is very nicely volunteered of what a really well-designed course can even look like in Moodle. And so you can see, um, this is from her recent Tackling Wicked Problems course, um, where she has like, Kathy is, Kathy's a star. I'm just gonna say that right now. Kathy, when I grow up, I wanna be like you. Um, 
you know, she has it down to the minutes on how long things might take. She has her check boxes for students to check off what they've gotten done. And then talking about, yes, even though that you might use other things besides the LMS, you can see over here on our image to the right, she actually has a link out to the team site that they used heavily in her course. So, this, excuse me. So the students still had a landing point to go to that was very well organized. You can see on the right, we have our introduction. We have our day lined up, um, you know, time breakdowns. And then if they had to jump out of here, they had an easy go to link to get to teams. Another example from another one of our instructors here at PSU, and I even wanted to get a, a nice image in it. He had um, a instructor who had Albert Einstein because she talked about Albert Einstein in her actual class. Um, and then it nicely laid out required readings, course materials, assignments, quick, easy, nice laid out so students know what you know know where to go to and know where to access it um you know canvas doesn't canvas has more robust linking and we'll talk about that here in a minute but this is still a very nice uh sorry canvas has more robust internal linking and we'll talk about that uh in a little bit but this is still has a nice organizational layout it would make it easier so our students are not expending that cognitive load um on trying to find out where do i submit something and they can like we talked about actually learn the material that we need them to learn. So now one of the things I've done is this is one of the designs I worked with instructors at Arizona State University as we switched over to Canvas. Um, kind of the similar layout. You have your module of objectives and then it's broken down. What do you need to read? What do you need to watch? What do you need to review? And what do you need to submit? And that's within the page and that's in the module introduction. As you can see, module one, an overview. And then within the organization of the over of the overall course in the modules area of Canvas, which we can talk about later, um, it's, a, it's organized the same way. Here's the overview at the top, and then it's broken down. What do you read? What do you watch? What do you review? And like I said, in Canvas, it's easy to build these internal links because there's hyperlinks there, which if you attend our Canvas introduction training later on in Jumpstart, you can um, you can learn about that, but they see these this common practice of linking to things that make it easier to access is important for that course design. Now this is really nice. The other another layout is if you kind of do that flipped classroom or that hey this is what this is layout you need to do. Here's another model of how it could be organized before class what you need to do, and this is what the page looks like, and then you have before class, in class and after class. So that way your students know what they need to do before they come to class. When you have them go to links or things that they might be using in class, they have one page to go to. And the and after class, they know what they're supposed to be doing. And so, you know, all this, all these things are around there for being able to understand or have a highly organized course so your students don't have to spend half their morning to figure out where they submit the assignment. And these are just a couple of simple frameworks. You know, like we talked about, we wanna make sure that, you know, your digital and framework is still representative of you, but we wanna make sure that it is organized. That is our slide deck. Um, I was just gonna add on to something you said, Jason, um, when we're talking about the consistency, um, consistency from week to week and module to module is important. Um, so the students have a feel for how everything is gonna be played out that week. Um, and also even in discussion forums, um, there's a lot of recommendations out there in instructional design um, forums and articles about discussion forums. And if, if you're gonna require um, two posts and then three responses on week one, and then on week two, you're requiring one post and two responses, that gets confusing for the students. So even with discussion forums, um, it's good to keep those numbers um, consistent throughout the weeks. Yeah. And that's, and that's, you can see our, our heading is all consistent, easy to navigate course design. That's all we really look for. I always tell my instructors, you know, your syllabus is your Bible, stick to that. Whatever you call something in your syllabus, call it in face-to-face, -face, call it in your digital, in your, in your learning management system. You got to be consistent and then just easy to navigate. You know, 
for me, this is really something I'm a history teacher, former history teacher. So I teach everything, I think everything of chronologically. I know not everybody thinks like that. And that's where something like this course design, where what do you read? What do you watch? What do you review? Is an easy way to organize your course. Or, you know, what do you do before class? What do you do in class? And what do you do after class is another way to organize your course. Really, we just want you to get frameworks to help organize your course so your students can make it easy, you know, have an easy way to find what they need to do and where they need to submit it to. So now we wanted to open up to questions. What do you guys have for us? I actually have a question for Kathy. Um, and I understand a little bit about this, um, setting the times um, for the different assignments, letting the students know approximately how long that assignment will take them. Um, but could you expand on that? Because I noticed you do that in your course design. Um, expand on what part of it? Um, um, maybe the reason behind using the times for the assignments. Yeah, I, you know, I, I really took to heart, Dave Cormier talked about it this morning and I can't remember where I read it, um, but I really took to heart the idea that our traditional notions of what makes a class are challenged by moving a course online, right? Like how, how many credit hours is a particular course worth typically has to do with how much time you meet. And the particular course that um, Jason showed is, was a online asynchronous class. So there, there was no synchronous meeting. So I was really interested in thinking about how much work did I think students needed to do in order to earn the credits for the course? So that was that was kind of my motivation. And um, I also think it's, you know, we, we often, when we assign papers for students, we say, you know, this should be a five page paper. I mean, I think part of the reason we do that is because we're trying to give guidelines to students. So when I was, thinking about students working in their groups to work on a project, I wanted to give them guidelines for how long I thought various things were gonna take them to, to work on. So there were multiple purposes for trying to figure out how much time each of the activities that I was having the students work on should take. Yeah, I, I think that would help the students a lot too, um, hearing from students that they're really struggling with planning and, and um, all of these deadlines, especially in this um, mixed modality, um, something like that would be really helpful to them. I'm also sure. thinking about the fact that we're getting feedback from students um, that some of the classes are requiring way too much work. And I think it can be helpful if you do what Kathy does and explain how much work time you think things will take to also check in with students to see if you're hitting the marks correctly, um, because it will be interesting to know if they say, hey, this thing you thought would take me, you know, 40 minutes actually took me three hours, this other thing took me less. So it's also probably a good way to have checks and balances for your own planning to get to get feedback from your students as well. The, the other the other thing that I did that I think was really helpful for a lot of students was I had read this article, which I can go find if, if anybody's interested in it. But I had read this article talking about the learning management system as moving from being just a file repository to an indication of the narrative journey that students are gonna take as they're taking your class. And so one of the things I tried to do was for every activity, every reading, every video they had to watch, whatever it was, I tried to explain to them why engaging in this activity is gonna help them do something else. And you know, this class is a project-based class and so Ultimately, uh, and, and that was helpful for me too, is like, why am I having them watch this video? Well, because that's going to help them generate ideas for their projects. So that articulation, I think, was very helpful for students. And I, I mean, I didn't do a study to see if students 
you know, watch the videos or did the reading more than they have in the past when I haven't laid out those reasons, but it felt like a, a lot of students were looking at things that maybe in the past they might have just skipped over to get right to whatever the assignment was. Well, Steph, Kathy, I want that article if you can find it. I will, I will find it because I've, I wrote a blog post about it because it was so, it was such a good, a good article. So I'll, I'll find it for you, Jason. Awesome. Thank you. And I'm, I'm not joking. I want to be like you when I grow up because this is beautiful and designed. So other questions from anybody out there? Jason, can you talk a little bit, this was in the chat, but can you talk a little bit about what the process is and the different roles that people play, like particularly you, the rest of the IT team and maybe our team. Um, like if somebody has a course that they think is working pretty well and they like their assignments and they like their syllabus, but their Moodle is boring or ugly or confusing or whatever, what kind, what should they do in order to get that one-on-one -on -one support? So I was kind of suggesting like, well, if you feel like your course needs lots of reworking, you could make an appointment with Martha, but if, if not, can they put in a um, IT request and then plan on a meeting with somebody like you to Absolutely. check out their LMS? Yep. They exactly how you outlined it. If they want to, um, you know, if they talk to you to help with the structure, you know, with the structure of their course, the assignments and things like that. Not that I can't help with those things, but that is Robin and Martha's forte. Um, and then if they want to meet with me, yep, you put a link into the help desk. They can submit a ticket saying, I want one I want a one-on-one -on -one consultation with Jason, and they get routed to me. And I would be more than happy to meet with you guys and talk about, you know, hey, this is how we can organize this in our LMS. These are different tools, digital tools that are out there to help you, you know, you know, do what you need to do. We can talk about the Kaltura video quizzing, or we can talk about, um, you know, student response systems or anything that you want to work on to, you know, incorporate better learning outcomes for you guys with student with your students and technology. And I think this is helpful for faculty at all our institutions to think about the two pieces that are going on here, right? One is um, what we classically call academic technology and one is what we classically call instructional design. And we're kind of mashing them up here, but at every, which is good, but at every campus, um, the academic technology now sits at this USNH consolidated IT. So if you want help, particularly with the design inside your learning management system, with your Canvas, with your Moodle, um, with how you uh, show videos in your classes and where you post your PDFs and um, how to keep it organized and that kind of stuff, then you wanna put in that central ticket to our consolidated IT. For people who want um, to talk more about how you've organized the course itself and how you maybe break it up into modules, um, you know, so you can see here, it looks like Kathy kind of has a, a week by week kind of a thing. You may go, you may be more thematic. Um, if you want to talk about how to set up your course in general and how to align your course to your learning outcomes, we all do that stuff, including the academic tech people, but for that, you'll wanna find your instructional design team. And those folks will, um, at Plymouth State, be in the co-lab. At uh, UNH, you'll be looking at things like CEDL. At Keene, you'll be talking about um, Jenny through the library and Chris. So, um, you know, you'll, you can probably get help wherever you go, uh, but putting in those tickets um, through the IT portal is the way to go for the academic technology and linking up with your teaching and learning folks is how to go if you need more course design support. Really, I usually try to sell it as, you know, Martha and Robin help you come up with the ideas of what you're teaching in your course. And then I help you translate it to digitally into the learning environment in order to have it come across effectively. And I, I also wanted to add that, um, you know, I think for people who know my work, I tend to be very critical of the learning management system. If I could, I would get rid of the learning management system tomorrow. I would literally flush it down the toilet. But I will tell you this, um, even though I teach my entire courses on the open web, 
I always use my learning management system exactly the way these guys are talking about, which is the way they get to my open web website, my syllabus, all the places where they're posting their own websites is through that first click into Moodle. So usually my Moodle has almost nothing in it except come into the course, you know, and there's a bright picture and you click it and you go in. Um, but no matter how crafty you're getting, I think you can see that in, in Kathy's stuff. Um, uh, while we all have this portal, especially during COVID, it's probably a really nice way, as Melissa said, I think she said, you can hang all your stuff right on there. Um, and then you can really go out to the world as much as you want. But they know if they're ever confused and they can't figure out where to go, they can go back to that, to that home base. And I, I think that's what's really helpful about Melissa's feedback is, you know, they're not asking for the, for new elaborate online tricks, which is kind of, you know, when you talk about online learning, people are always trying to one up each other on the coolness factor of the internet. And that's great, but we're definitely hearing from students um, that clarity is really, really helpful. So for that, the LMS is, is a really useful tool. Um, do people have any other questions that you think might be helpful um, for Anne's you got or her, for anyone else? Anne's got her hand raised. Go ahead, Anne. Yes, hi. I, I, you may have covered this earlier. I was like five minutes late. Um, and Melissa, you were showing those some of the data. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, I did some um, library instruction via uh, into the classrooms. I went into the classrooms because so many of the students did not come to a library. And I was hearing and seeing consistently that students were not coming to class even on days when they could come to class. Um, I also have a senior here at PSU who who had that attitude, ah, I'm not going to go to class and then decided no, no, when, when it's my day to go, I want to go. So I was wondering if there were any kind of um, information that you could, the survey gleaned on why some people chose to stay in their dorms or wherever they happen to be. Um, when yeah, they yeah. come to, to class. That that's a that's a really great question. And um, the students did not give a lot of feedback on that. Um, I can speak for myself because I only teach one class. I, I'm no expert, but I teach an 8 a.m. tackling a wicked problem, 8 a.m. on a Monday. That was the worst my, time to have a class. My students were in the classroom and they didn't have to be. They could have zoomed in. Um, but but I asked them because they 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 said um, basically. The face they learn better face to face, and it's easier to interact. There, there were a lot of students did comment on the challenges of um, the hybrid model when you have students in the classroom and students um, on Zoom um, at the same time. There are some audio difficulties for the students who are on Zoom. I know when I did have a few students on occasionally, um, I had to repeat everything someone in the classroom said. It's a very interactive class, so um, a student in the even the middle row. Um, saying something in a normal voice, the students online couldn't make out what they were saying. So it was just that getting into the habit of consistently repeating. Melissa, um, you, were, but, Melissa you were in a classroom with an owl camera, correct? I was in a classroom with an owl camera. Okay. Um, it, <laughs> it was better than nothing, but it wasn't ideal um, for audio. And I think that was a common um, concern around campus. Um, another thing that the students said um, was the students in the survey said was they, some of them liked that option because they don't wanna get out of bed. And I know in my very first class, I held it on Zoom because it was like some people's test results hadn't come in yet and things like that. And there was a student in bed, um, laying in bed, curled up in his comforter. He looked comfy, but I was just thinking, wow, is this, is this how, it, how it works? And I think sometimes it does and the cameras are off. Um, but their cameras were all on the first time. Um, they go off um, throughout the term though. The last time I did have students on Zoom, they were all um, little black rectangles, um, which is difficult for interacting. Um, so there, there isn't actually a lot of feedback um, on why they would choose to be, because it, it, it's kind of interesting because they have all these concerns about the quality of being online and all of this. Um, you know, not being able to hear the audio and, and this and that. And, and a lot of them have stated in surveys that the faculty member is really honed in on the students in the classroom and, and the students on Zoom are, are kind of an afterthought. 
it's really difficult to, to do both at the same time. Um, but that was a comment that they had as well. But I, I feel like the students that did comment on it said they like that option because they don't want to get out of bed. They want to just don't want to have to get dressed and run to class or, you, you know, they have other things going on and they can be wherever. They can be anywhere. We, we did present a small study this summer, um, you know, which was kind of before you know, I mean, high flex is still a kind of a new thing, even though it was around for a long time, not nobody was doing it until COVID particularly, but we had presented, um, actually, I think it was in April when we were first offering professional development around this. And the study showed that um, really contradictory things. Um, and so it showed number one, that even at the end of a term, students in high flex environments said that they learned better face to face. And that happened at the same time as they decreased the number of times that they participated face to face when given the high flex option. So that was interesting that they said they learned better face to face, but they selected instead the online option. And then the, um, another interesting piece of that study, um, hold on, I lost my thought. I wanna make sure I get it back. Um, they were face to face. I'm gonna get it in a second. Uh, there was another piece. They went online. There's just like a massive blank where my brain is supposed to be. Um, they chose, oh, uh, the other piece was that they said that they would actually prefer to always, even after any you know, necessity, have a high flex option um, and that they would even pay extra for it to have the high flex option all the time. And that was at the same time as they said that they didn't learn as well when they moved online and they did move online. So again, what you're seeing from students when you get the student feedback, it's not like you can make clear des design decisions based on the student feedback because the student feedback is a bit um, contradictory. But I don't think it's contradict. It's contradictory. I think if you decide is high flex good or bad, then you end up in this world of contradiction. But what they're clearly asking for, really strongly, in the desire for high flex is is flexibility. Right? They like the uh, idea of being flexible. But when possible, they want to have face-to-face -face learning experiences. So it's one of the reasons that Martha and I have started to lean towards, you know, how can you give them a bunch of online content, maximum flexibility, um, but perhaps keep them um, feeling like it's worth the inconvenience and challenge, especially during COVID, to find a way to get there face-to-face -face for certain um, high impact practices, right? So maybe it's not always worth the challenge of being face to face. And it's, it's a little bit like COVID now, right? It's, I mean, sometimes it's really not worth getting together because of all the risks you have to take and all the preparations you have to make. But sometimes it really might be, you think about Thanksgiving and the number of people who sat in their garages 10 feet away from somebody while masked trying to eat turkey, because sometimes it, it really mattered to be face to face. Um, but it is interesting to look at the small number of studies that are out there on high flex, you know, definitely reveal students having very um, self contradictory opinions about uh, about the experience. Well, humans never try to never do things in their own best interest. We always are contradictory to what we do. But I will say, like, even with that high flex, the, the mo uh, an important part of that is going to be a well organized course, especially in the in the digital environment. So any other questions? This isn't a question, but I added a link to the chat um, for the Plymouth State faculty to view all of the COVID survey results that we've been doing even um, last spring. The results are there if you, if you care to look through those. Um, UNH, your results are on Tableau Public. Um, and Keen, been trying to find out how you can get your results now that George Smeaton is retired. Um, I'm <laughs> I am not sure, but you could probably check with um, maybe Vicki in the IRNA office if you're Classic interested. Classic in US&H. Somebody <laughs> leaves and like, where did all that stuff go? 
Um, I want to thank you guys for this and let folks know that for Plymouth State people, we do have another session planned on this at January Jamboree. Um, I did get some feedback that maybe it would be helpful because they're going to do another hour long session. Maybe we split that up into two back to back 30 minutes where the first 30 minutes really focuses on the survey data and then the design to follow just because there may be more people interested in the survey data who don't have a course that they need to, to redesign. Um, but lots of people, I think, interested in the, um, in the responses of our students. So thanks to you guys. And with that, I'm gonna stop the recording. I'm just gonna add on to that regarding the survey data. Um, Jim Miller, yeah, who also works in the I, Office of Institutional Effectiveness at Plymouth um, is doing a session at January Jamboree about the survey data and the changes that we've seen since the Plymouth Student Satisfaction Survey um, with a COVID component as well, if you're interested in that. Oh, excellent. I didn't, I thought that was a different set of, of data. So that's, that's great. No, it, it also yeah. incorporates this data, yeah. Perfect.